Um, all right, uh, let's get started. Hi, my name is Nakul, and I would like to welcome you on a talk about distributed tracing. I would like to kick off this talk by discussing why even we should bother about latency and what role it plays in the distributed world. Then I would like to move on on distributed tracing and show how it fits in resolving such type of issues. Then there will be a short demo just to get a feel about tracing in journal. After that, we will discuss Zipkin and take a look on a few of its core concepts. And finally, I would like to walk you through the code that I use for the sample presentation. Um, all right, so what is latency? Well, one may define it in simple words as the amount of time it takes to complete an action. Every task we perform takes some amount of time. For example, if I fly from city A to city B, then let's say my flight time is two hours, so my net latency is going to be two hours in this case. In computer, every operation that we perform takes some amount of time. For example, accessing L1 cache, L2 cache, uh, acquiring lock, uh, releasing lock, uh, accessing man memory, uh, disk seek, all those operations take some amount of time. Maybe the time is so small that it is almost negligible for human eye, and maybe if we are not faced with a huge traffic, then we even simply don't bother about those times uh, which all those tiny operations takes. However, when we are hit with a huge scale, then all those small operations starts to sum up, and that's where we start to scratch our head and start to worry about. So you may ask, well, who really cares about latency in journal? Well, it's an end user who is impacted the most, uh, but the interesting thing is he or she, they don't sit with a stopwatch and measure the time of your application that how slow it is or how fast it is. On the contrary, they are driven by their needs and they want to interact with your application just to uh, accomplish some task and be happy. However, in some cases, speed is the name of the game. For example, in a trading system, a low latency can make a difference between uh, grabbing an opportunity or losing an opportunity. So the point I'm trying to make here is that uh, in general, users don't care how fast your application performs, but they do tend to notice when things start to get slower. What makes distributed world so uh, unique or interesting? Well, in a distributed system, a single call may end up touching hundreds of services uh, written in different programming languages using different runtime environment and potentially deployed across many machines. In a monolithic world, however, uh, we could squeeze a lot of information in our head. We can use some diagrams, some documentation, and maybe uh, try to uh, kind of reflect the current state of our production on those using those diagram or documentation, and may consult it when we encounter some problems. Uh, in a microservice world, on the other hand side, the picture is ever changing. New services can spin up at any time. Old services can be removed. SERP can be upgraded. Simply, it's uh, too hard to catch up and to you know, squeeze all this information on, in, the, uh, uh, in the head is quite a difficult task. Uh, and to be honest, it's, it's kind of impossible to keep track of all those things because there are hundreds of moving components. So let me tell you a story about uh, Bob. Bob is a, uh, is a programmer who uses microservices in order to migrate uh, their legacy application and address new business needs. However, recently he started uh, receiving some requests from a bunch of customers saying that, well, the system is really working slow. Since there could be many potential source of problems like uh, slow disk, uh, maybe network errors, uh, slow queries, garbage collector kicking in at odd times, Bob simply had no idea where to start even looking for the problem. Uh, even uh, to start kind of exploring the things which may go wrong. Uh, Bob didn't realize that time that he was suffering from long tail latency. However, uh, however, Bob wanted to troubleshoot the problem and wanted to address that problem. So um, he tried a couple of options. And the number one option which he tried was log analysis because logs were available to him at, uh, at the hand and he wanted to kind of uh, start looking for some sort of uh, anomalies uh, in, in, in log. However, when we have a uh, distributed world, we, have large, we can have many services, and due to this, we can have lots and lots of log files. Once we start to look into the log files, we can find an overwhelming amount of information, and a lot of it contains noise and distraction, like thread dumps, async, some stack traces. Moreover, not every service we need to examine in order to resolve such problems. 
What I mean by this is uh, some of the services are not in the critical path, which means that uh, some services can be async in nature. What it means is that they receive a request, they issue HTTP 200 and start some background uh, process. So uh, in order to resolve such problems, it's important to understand the critical path and concentrate only on those services which are in the critical path. Um, also correlating, since there is so much information to process, also we need some way to correlate those information and manually correlating all those information takes some amount of time. At the end, we end up with a bunch of numbers which simply doesn't make sense. You may ask why? Well, what we should do with those numbers? Shall we take median? Shall we take mode? Shall we take standard deviation? Uh, what should we do with this, these numbers to make the sense out of them? So this approach didn't lead Bob to some kind of a productive finding about his problem. So then he switched to matrix. Well, matrices in journal are good. They can say something is wrong. However, they cannot tell us what is the real cause of the problem. They can just show us the problem in some cases, uh, but they can't tell the cause. Also, the way in which we aggregate this data may end up deceiving us more. For example, let's consider a city where million people are living and one person is making uh, 20 million uh, dollars a, a month and rest others are making a dollar a, a month. If you take the average of that sample set, uh, you may get false positive. You may, uh, you may think that people in this city are really happy from the wages. However, the story is far away from the truth. Uh, and the same goes with, with latency. If you take the latency and you try to kind of take the mean uh, or the median of the latency, then it is of no good in, uh, in order to kind of get anything meaningful out of it. So Bob started to wonder that time that, uh, well, is it possible to find how many clients are really impacted by this problem? So that's the time when Bob learned about percentiles. And percentile is the statistics that identifies the percentage of data that is less than a given value. To be precise, Bob was really interested to know the 99th percentile of his system. And what 99th percentile mean in his case was that one out of 100 visit experienced some delay, D. And let's assume this delay is 50 milliseconds. So the total number of visits that experience the delay can be calculated easily using N divided by, by 100. So if we divide half a million by 100, we get this number. Uh, now the question arises whether this number is too big to be alarming. Well, looking at, you know, from half a million, if we have 5,000 requests, it's not a big deal. Uh, however, let's not forget that Bob was dealing in a distributed domain or a distributed system. So in his system, a single visit was resulting in making eight downstream calls, which were interacting with a highly active service. And this service was 99% fast and only 1% slow. Now, taking this equation into consideration, the likelihood of encountering a latency becomes 1 minus 99%, which is 0 0.99, to the power of number of downstream calls, which is 8 in our case. If we do the maths, we end up with 8%. Now, the total number of visits affected are 8% of n. And as you can see, this number is all of a sudden bumped up. It's 40,000. To add more pain to the misery is they, there can be repeated visits in a day. So if a single client visits multiple times our system, the likelihood that they will encounter uh, or their visit will land up in one of these long tail latency problem is quite high. Also, if you notice that the number, this number, uh, 40,000, is directly dependent on two things. First is the performance of this highly active service. So 99%, and second is the number of downstream calls. So if any of those changes, this number will end up uh, to kind of increase or decrease. So Bob was really happy. He said, well, I really find something. He went to the boss, but boss uh, said, all right, you find whatever you find, but just go and fix this damn problem. Uh, but Bob kind of came back to his desk and still was thinking that he's missing a lot and a lot of information in order to resolve this problem. He didn't know the request timeline, and request timeline simply will help him to understand which services were invoked, which operations were involved, how much time they took, 
Um, what was the call graph at that time? Uh, how many services were at the critical path? Uh, he also didn't know how to correlate all the logs information. Moreover, Bob wanted a way to kind of execute the same request on different clusters and notice whether the same request behaves slow in every cluster or maybe half of them or maybe only for the east zone of the customer. He needed a way to kind of uh, execute the request, gather some data and compare it. But unfortunately, he didn't have something like this at his hand. Moreover, if there was some sort of a delay, it was important to understand how much this delay comparing to the acceptable value because nothing works in a, let's say, blazing time. There is always an over, uh, overhead involved in sending and transferring the packet or reading something from the disk. Um, finally, he wanted to understand the call graph. Uh, what were, how the call graph looked like when this problem uh, tried to kind of um, show up in the production environment. Bob, in a nutshell, was missing distributed tracing. So what is a distributed tracing? Well, it helps to track request flow. Uh, the tracing data is available within minutes. So thanks to this, we can react really, really fast and kind of address the problem. Also, uh, it uses dynamically instrumentation of apps. It means we don't have to go and kind of update lots and lots of services in order to benefit with this approach. Uh, the collected data provides lots and lots of valuable information, such as uh, the critical path of the request, uh, which services are at critical path. Uh, they can help to understand the call graph, which services were invoked, which operations were involved, uh, what was the time taken by each and every individual operation, and I will show you during the demo uh, how it looks like. Moreover, uh, now using this uh, collected data or trace data, we can measure end-to-end -end latency quite easily. Uh, we can go even a step further, we can do some sort of call pattern optimization. So let's say uh, my service is invoking some other service 20 or 30 times. Uh, and looking at this call pattern, maybe I can cache the request, I can cache it locally and try some overhead. Or maybe uh, there is some code which have to be executed asynchronously, but uh, the programmer made some uh, bug and because of this, uh, the code is executed in synchronous manner rather than asynchronous manner. So uh, how can we apply all this knowledge? Well, the answer is tracing system. So a tracing system should be able to trace, and when I say it should be able to trace, I don't mean it should be able to trace for a particular language across cluster or zones. It should be able to uh, trace independent of your programming stack. So it should not force you that, all right, use only Java or Python or Scala to build your system. It should be able to work with different programming languages, and it should not have any assumption about programming languages in general. Uh, it should have the low overhead because the last thing you want is to bring down your production because you are trying to kind of collect some data uh, for, for the tracing system. It should be able to scale as per your demand and also it should work 24-7 uh, and round the year because production bugs are really difficult to reproduce. And it really shouldn't, shouldn't, shouldn't rely on programmers' collaboration because if it requires pro, uh, programmers to log in some specific way or collaborate in some specific way, then it will, you know, it will ruin the, the idea of tracing system because it defeats the purpose of a tracing system. That is, it should work uh, uh, flawlessly and have as minimum impact on development team as possible. So let me introduce you OpenZipkin, which is uh, open source uh, tracing uh, system. So Zipkin is a distributed tracing system. It is created by Twitter. Uh, it is based on a paper published uh, by Google called Dapper. And what Open Zipkin is, Open Zipkin is a GitHub organization. And what they really did is they did take the primary, they fought the, the Zipkin and removed the bit specific from, the, uh, from Twitter and made it available for all of us. Uh, it's open source and uh, super, super important is the pluggable architecture, uh, which help us to incorporate open Zipkin in our production environment uh, using or leveraging our existing knowledge. One thing which we should all kind of try to understand before moving forward, and I will show you the demo, is span. So what is a span? Uh, span is something which is used by open Zipkin, and what it means is uh, it denotes a logical unit of work done. It is expressed in a human-readable string like uh, 
create catalog, calculate cost, foo, bar, you name them. It is created by Tracer, uh, which is an instrumented code, and they are super slim, so it's very easy to create, and also the storage uh, is not so, so heavy. Uh, last but not the least, the, the initial span which is created during the life cycle of an HTTP request uh, is called uh, a root span, that is a span without a parent ID. Uh, how Zipkin works, and let's try to understand some of the core annotation of Zipkin. So we have a client and a server. So a client makes a request to the server. Let's say he want to get some resource, in my case, get catalog. And at this point, the Zipkin marks the beginning of the span. The server receives the request after some time. And now if we take the time at which the server received the request, and the time at which the client sent the request, if we subtract these two, we can get the network latency. After some time, server, let's say, process our uh, request, and he's ready to hand out the response back to the client. So if we want to find out how much processing time our server took in order to process this request, what we can do is we can subtract the SS, which means server sent, minus server received. And these two are the time, which we can subtract and get uh, uh, some value. Finally, the servers hand out the response back to the client. Client received the uh, response, and the Zipkin marks the end of the span. So the span is, uh, is, is, ter is finished at this point. The network latency can be calculated, and this time the latency on the client side. So how much time it took for client to receive the response back from the server. And it can be calculated also using CR minus SS, which is client received minus server sent. Um, if you are interested to calculate the overall response time of this single request, what we can do is uh, we can simply subtract CR, which is the time at which the client received the span uh, or the response minus the time at which the client sent. And this is how, in a nutshell, Zipkin works. Are there any question at this point? Yep. Hello. Uh, probably I missed uh, something in the beginning, but I was wondering what is actually the, the, the actual input of Zipkin. So it is analyzing uh, logs? Uh, I will show you this on a next slide. Okay, uh, but uh, uh, to answer your question, it's, uh, it receives some, uh, so it just intercept your request and it mm -hmm. tried to create some uh, data, which I will show you in a moment and it kind of propagate those data, some randomness, let's say 128 bits of ID, and it patch every request. Uh, but I will show you how it is on the next slide. Thank you. Uh, so um, coming back to this, what, is the, uh, what happened at the server side when, uh, when we request this, res uh, this resource? So we had, what happened at the server side is we had some catalog service, and what catalog service did is, it invoke some price service to get the price, and then it invokes some product service. The product service return, consult with some database to get the list of uh, products. It do some data analytics to do some analytic job, and finally the response was hand over to the client. All those things which you see on those green boxes are called span, and the collection of those span is called trace. One thing important to note here is that if you will take a look, the IDs are one, for example, the trace ID is one or span ID is one. Why it is not 100, 200, 1000? Well, to answer this question, uh, I didn't have a space on my uh, slides to put what Zipkin really generates. So what Zipkin do or use as an ID is 64-bit uh, or 128-bit of randomness. Uh, depending on the version of Zipkin. So the IDs are not simply one, two, three, or some so on and so forth. They are some random uh, generated, uh, some, 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 some sort of randomness, depending on the version of Zipkin. Uh, could you repeat the, the question so that it will be clear for everyone? Yeah, you said you don't need to integrate it with your application code. Uh, yeah. And you saw some methods? Oh, okay. Trace IDs and stuff. Uh, you mean? Uh, no, no. Next slide. All right. 
trace IDs? So this trace ID is something which is generated by Zipkin because it have instrumentation code. So when you make a HTTP request, it intercept also and it generate this trace ID. So it is not something which we have to generate or the users of the library have to generate. So, okay. It, Maybe you should show us some code after this. All right. So uh, the last thing is the concept of trace, and trace is uh, a DAG, which is a directed acyclic graph of spans. Now is the time of demo, so I will show you how uh, these things work. So um, the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to, uh, so important thing is everything is on the GitHub, so you can go check out and do everything locally, what I'm doing here. What I have is I clone this application, which I have hosted on my GitHub, and I'm running it locally. Um, if I make right now some HTTP GET request here, sure enough I get some uh, JSON in, in return. Uh, I hope you all can read it. Um, I have some bunch of I, some bunch of products, some price, some ID, but uh, I haven't told you anything about how the demo application works. So let's head over to Zipkin and maybe try to ask Zipkin whether it can give us some valuable feedback. Uh, I click here on the dependency diagram. And as you can see, uh, I have some diagram generated here. This diagram is generated purely by Zipkin. Uh, what I can see here is I have some price service, which is used by a catalog service. And also I have some product service, uh, which uses uh, some other services, which is Apache Spark and Mongo. So um, at this time, I have a pretty good idea that I have a bunch of services like catalog service, uh, which call two other services, price and product service, and this service also call or uses two other services. Uh, so far, so good. Uh, now, let's try to ask Zipkin what happened when we made the HTTP request. So, um, as you can see here, we can uh, sort it by time. So, when I click here, uh, and I expand it all, um, the first thing I can notice uh, here is just to answer the, uh, the question here. Uh, you asked me this trace ID and this. So as you can see, here is the trace ID, which was generated for the trace. Um, and there are some other trace ID which are also generated. And also the parent IDs are attached here. So you can process this JSON, and this JSON is just rendered by the GUI service. The question is different. I will ask <laughs> OK. Um, so um, what we have here is a catalog service, and uh, we have a create catalog here uh, method which was invoked. So we, can, we, we see that we did three things here. Uh, also, this is uh, shown here. So I can zoom it and see here. So I have a price fetch. And if I uh, zoom a bit out, uh, I can see that uh, then the products were fetched, and then the email were sent. Uh, creating a catalog uh, resulted in calling the price service. So as you can see uh, that I use Histrix under the hood. So right now I haven't even shown you the source code and I have pretty good idea that uh, I'm using some sort of circuit breaker implementation under the hood. And uh, when I make this request uh, for fetching the, uh, the price, I invoke some uh, calculate cost. Uh, thing and what it is well I can see here that the class which kind of represent this service was called price service and the method which was invoked is called calculate cost um, and also we can see how much time it took in order for Zipkin to uh, or in order for this service to calculate and return the response in the similar manner we can say uh, see that then we call the product service, which means we end up calling again another HTTP call. And this HTTP call, what we did, we did two things. We, we retrieve the products and we filter the products. Um, and if we click here, we have all the details uh, about the particular uh, product service. And also we can see, for example, what was the query that got ex executed um, here. So all this idea I have right now without even touching the source code or explaining you some diagram that how my demo application work. Last but not the least, uh, asyn uh, there was some asynchronous uh, job or 
or uh, task that was as executed and it also uh, kind of listed it. Uh, I can see that the full duration took 1.643 seconds and all this data is generated by Zipkin. Uh, when I will show you the source code, I will also show you how it works. Um, all right, uh, but now let's try to uh, execute, I don't know, a bunch of requests here. Uh, so uh, for example, not one, but 10 or 100. And in this case, if I will, um, I'm executing the request and I got something uh, like 100% requests are executed. So I can go to Zipkin and if I say find traces, I have all the traces here, I can sort them by the date and we can see that all of them were executed less than a minute ago. Uh, but you know, on production, not everything works smoothly. On demo, everything should work smoothly. But on production, uh, things doesn't work smoothly. So uh, I try to kind of replicate some scenario here in which uh, some request will end up taking a bit of more time. So as you can see, it is taking a bit of more time and now finally I get the, uh, some JSON back. So let's go to the Zipkin and try to see what happened during this request. So if I say the find trace here and I say um, new as first, I see that less than a minute ago, uh, some request was executed and if I click here, um, I want you to concentrate right now on calculate cost. So as you can see, there is a small bubble here and it says like cache miss. So I can click here and see, for example, what happened. So uh, the new entry was calculated. This time I hard coded because I didn't want you guys to wait 30 seconds for uh, something to come up. Uh, also, I know that on which cluster it was executed. So let's say if you are using AWS and you are running some Lambda function, so it comes uh, quite handy to log such sort of a details. Also, uh, I know uh, one more thing that is, uh, the relative time of this operation in milliseconds. Uh, you may ask, well, why this is red here? Well, I will explain you this error later. Uh, I mean, on the next request. Uh, but it, have, uh, it is something with a, uh, let's say, random number. I have some random number running on my uh, service. And depending on the random number, it mark error condition or not. So um, let me show you now uh, another thing. Let's say I try to replicate now, uh, ask for, uh, I want to simulate a scenario in which one of my services is down. Uh, so when I try to uh, ask for such a product, I see that it took a bit longer, obviously, and if I go here and I try to find the trace, um, uh, Already we can see that uh, there is some problem. The color of the trace is uh, a bit different here. And if I go directly here and I can expand them all, I can see that where exactly the problem was. So if I click here for the details, I can see that error is true. So uh, Zipkin, as you can see, if a service goes down, it's not like Zipkin also goes down with the service and don't try to um, trace things. It try to figure out what happened and, and report it. Um, also, uh, one thing uh, which comes quite handy when we are dealing in production environment is uh, asking Zipkin some fancy or some useful questions. So if you take a look here um, on find trace, I had something like uh, somewhere the cache was missed. But let's say I'm only interested to find all the traces where the cache miss happened. So I can just say and write cache.miss. Uh, and Zipkin will, uh, Zipkin understand the syntax and Zipkin will give me all the traces where the cache miss happens. However, let's say I want to, uh, again, narrow down this query because right now I have too much uh, traces and I want to know only where the cluster was uh, cluster one. So I want to now know all the queries or all the traces in which A, the cache was missed and B, the computation was executed on some cluster, which is called cluster one, but it can be called foo, bar, or whatever. If I hit enter, now you can see the Zipkin end up filtering uh, those traces for me, and it will only show me those traces in which uh, the cache was missed and the cluster was one. If I go back here and I say, um, show me the cache miss, but for the cluster two, and I execute here, um, I can see there was only one request in which uh, such scenario happened. 
And uh, we can also uh, go and ask Zipkin further more. Uh, using the UI we, can, uh, UI, we can also filter some things. So here we can uh, calculate basing on the HTTP and slash one. Why it is slash one? Because look, when I executed here a request, um, I provided the ID here as one. So this is why it kind of take the method, it was HTTP and concatenate with the param which was passed. I can also filter here by the start time or the end time. Also I can filter only the trace which took bigger than X number of microseconds. So Zipkin have the notation of the time down to the microseconds. Um, and I can also limit the results of the query. Um, so I think that's uh, all for this part of the demo and I will show you uh, some other parts later. Uh, so now let's try to understand the architecture of the Zipkin in order to get a better understanding how Zipkin works because right now I've shown you that, all right, I made a bunch of requests, some diagram was generated, I asked some uh, JSON and it was rendered, but how internally all those things work. So what we have, we have some service. It can be a price service, catalog service. Uh, so a service is some Python code or Java code, whatever you say. And in this service, we have some instrumented code running which is a tracer, and his job is to collect and convert the spans. The spans get transported by a scribe, Kafka, uh, or HTTP. Once the spans are transported, the collector receives the span, and his job is to deserialize the, uh, the, the spans, sample them, and schedule them for storage. The storage, what it does, it, it stores the span in the database. And right now, we can use Cassandra, MySQL, or Elasticsearch. Uh, these three are supported. So if you feel more comfortable with MySQL, then you can use it. Uh, obviously, there is a um, performance uh, thing which you have to consider. But uh, Zipkin provides the storage out of the box. Um, after that, once the spans get stored in the storage, the API service retrieves the data from the storage. So it's like it reads those spans, and uh, it can provide it, in this case, to UI. So UI is just contacts the API and visualizes the information. But the same information, uh, if we want, we can uh, use, for example, we can ask Zipkin, the API service, so this API directly, we can ask Zipkin, for example, to give us uh, name of the services which it knows. And this is are the name of services which UI here uses to render in this Dropbox. So as you can see, UI just is a consumer of the, uh, of the API service. We can write some machine learning code and also uh, contact the API service and process them in a clever way. Also, we can ask uh, not only this information to the API service, but API service knows also a bit more, not only about span, but also some metadata, like which version of the Zipkin I'm running. Uh, and for example, the current health of the system. Uh, and using this, if I, for example, uh, parse this, you can see that I can see the status of my Zipkin uh, is up, it is using in-memory storage, what is the type of collector I'm using, and how much disk uh, space it is, it have used total, and how much it is free. So API, if you want to kind of ask these sort of questions, API uh, is your friend. And uh, also you can ask some other question, uh, for example, what is the configuration, uh, and it comes handy when you are running it in production, uh, and let's curl it, and it, uh, we can ask the API service to give us also the configuration which is used by, uh, by the Zipkin. So I, here I can see that I have query limit of 10, which means I'm only storing up to 10 uh, records, and I'm instrumenting everything, this uh, right now. Uh, all right, and last but not the least is uh, this thing, I think it's better to show you on the browser because it will render nicely. So uh, API service also expose some sort of matrix by default. Um, and some of those matrices can be used, for example, for Prometheus in order to uh, monitor the things in more better way. And now let's go back to the slides. 
So um, now uh, I would like to talk about tags. What tags are? Well, tag is a key value pair uh, used by Zipkin. Uh, they are not timestamp things. So a span may contain zero or more tags. And where you will like to use tags? Well, think about tag like uh, debugging information that will come handy for you when you will encounter some problem. Uh, can we like create tag for everything in the system? Probably not, uh, because uh, then again it will create too much burden uh, on the tracing system. Uh, Zipkin don't say uh, that you shouldn't create so many tags, but try to think in the clever way, like tag on create tags for only those things which might be useful when you are debugging this, uh, some problem. Log, on the other hand side, they denote some events. And to be more precise, they de denote some meaningful movement in the lifetime of a span. Uh, they are timestamped values. Uh, and in my demo, I just kind of created those logs using uh, uh, Zipkin API. Uh, and I will show you on the code how to create it. Uh, but the important thing is that they are timestamped, and a span can contain zero or n number of logs. Annotation helps to explain the latency with the timestamp. And as we noticed just on a uh, few slides before, they are often described using codes like SR, uh, CS, and so on and so forth. Uh, what are the binary annotation? Well, binary annotation are the tags. Uh, they, they tag a span with a context. And usually, those uh, things are used to support query or aggregation. So for example, let's say, uh, or, and, and the important thing also is they can be repeatable and vary on the host. So let's say if we have HTTP.path and we have URL rewriting enabled on the server, so uh, it will have a different value for uh, the client and for the server. Uh, an important question comes in our mind when we are dealing with span is can we have a span which are very big? Uh, obviously, no one stops you to do such thing, but you have to remember that at the end, it will end up decreasing the usability of tracing system, and also it will increase the cost of uh, tracing system. So this is something which Zipkin doesn't recommend, but you know, no one stops you to do it. But the best thing is uh, try not to create spans which are very heavy uh, in size. Uh, the next thing which we should really care about is uh, clock skew, uh, because the clock, uh, on computer ticks at different rate. My, the clock at, on my laptop right now can show me that the time is something, and on your laptop, maybe it will show the same time or maybe a bit different time. However, in a distributed world, if the clocks are not synchronized and they don't agree on a common notation of the time, we can end up with all sorts of funny problems. And Trace and um, Zipkin heavily relies on this thing. Because if we have a clock skew uh, on our, uh, in our environment, then we may end up having some information generated by Zipkin, which will make maybe not so much sense, or maybe which will give you a false negative or positive. Uh, how to deal with such a problem? We can use uh, NTP, or we can, use, uh, we can mount some uh, GPRS things on our data center, or we can use even Lampot clocks if we want to go even to microsecond level. And uh, who creates all those uh, spans? Who takes care of passing those data? So basically, uh, who does all the magic in Zipkin? So the one thing which, who do, uh, is, which is responsible for all those heavy lifting is Tracer. And what Tracer does is, Tracer is the one who takes care of creating a span, making sure that the IDs are generated when the next call is called, making sure that the uh, parent ID is passed, um, data is propagated properly. So uh, if, you are, if you are interested uh, to know uh, about the heavy lifting, then Tracer is the answer. Uh, sampling is something which helps us to control how much data we want to record. So if we have a high traffic system, then it is enough to record only a fraction of those uh, requests. Why? Because if we have a problem in our uh, production environment, it will probably uh, reproduce after n number of uh, requests, and it will be easily, easily noticed. However, if we have a low traffic, then we should adjust the needs uh, based on our uh, use case scenario. Sometimes we should note that there is a 
scenario in which we want to log, log our uh, span irrespective of the sampling policy. So in this case, we can use a uh, debug flag, and debug flag uh, just say to Zipkin, no matter what, you should just uh, record this span. Uh, irrespective of the sampling policy. And if you are running Zipkin on, on cloud or somewhere, then uh, sampling can also help you to lower the cost because uh, only those requests which are sampled, they will be stored in the database. Open tracing uh, helps to standardize the tracing. Its goal is to standardize tracing. It provides vendor neutral tracing API and the implementation is available in six language. Um, if you are on AWS, uh, on Amazon, uh, Amazon have their own thing called X-Ray. Uh, it basically works with Amazon EC2, Elastic uh, uh, Beanstalk, uh, Lambda, and uh, they have different kind of notation of the vocabulary. So what they have is the data which is collected at each point is called segment, and it is stored as a chunk of JSON. Currently, they so support three languages, Node.js, Java, and C-sharp. Uh, does Spring Cloud Sleuth uh, support right now actually? Well, there is an open ticket where you can monitor the progress, but at this moment, I'm not aware uh, that they support it. It is something which might be supported. Um, so what the Spring Cloud Sleuth does? Well, it brings the distributed tracing to Spring uh, World. In a nutshell, it takes all your heavy work of making sure that the tracing data will be passed from one thread to another, all those IDs and all those stuff. It take care uh, all of all those works under this project called Spring Cloud Starter uh, Zipkin, and it supports Hystrix, uh, Async, REST template, uh, uh, Spring integration. You can find more information on uh, on the docs. So now I would like you uh, like to walk you through the code. Uh, here is the code which you can uh, find. So. Um, the first thing I would like to show you is uh, the catalog service. So uh, what I have here is I have the application here. As you can see, it's a simple Spring Boot application. I have nothing fancy. Uh, this is something which I will explain you, uh, but it's something which I can omit if I'm not using executor service. So uh, what I have here, I have a method create catalog and it get trace. All these things, you can even delete it So you can de delete all the, the tracer things here, and it will still work. Uh, why I have added them? Well, because I wanted to show you the customization which you can do if you want to go a bit fancy with this. But you can delete all those things, and still it will work. So there is no something like you have to inject all these things. This code was injected just to show you how if you want to uh, go beyond uh, adding the standard things in the Zipkin, how you can do it uh, in Spring Cloud. Uh, but uh, what we do here is where the real magic begins, which you have to use in the API, is when I call the get price, if you are using Hystrix, for example, you are using Hystrix command. But here, you have to use new trace command. And what trace command does is trace command extends the Hystrix command, and it kind of, as you can see, it adds all the tracing related stuff here. So the only thing which you have to do is you have to use instead of Hystrix command, trace command, or uh, if you are uh, using, for example, some uh, thread pool, so we have to, f uh, sorry, uh, not here. Let's say if you are using some executor service, then the executor service should be declared using traceable executor service, which implements executor service. So these are the two things which you have to involve at the, in the work. Um, but under the hood, as you can see, I can just simply uh, fetch the things and uh, invoke some simple rest template dot get for object. So nothing fancy here. Um, and also I would like to show you the, the things with cluster. So what I did is in price service, I just simply implemented some dumb logic that I have some cache and when cache miss happens, so if cache is price, if the price is not in the cache, I just add this tag, but again, you don't have to add it. It is all because I wanted to show that how you can use the API of Zipkin uh, to go beyond the uh, out-of-the-box things which are supplied uh, with Zipkin. 
Um, last but not the least is, let's say what if you don't have sp uh, Zipkin, uh, sorry, Spring Cloud available for the particular language. So in this case, I have, uh, I'm using Go here, and what I, I can do here is I ha I'm using some uh, APIs here, and thanks to this API, what I can do is, when the request comes for me, so when the product handler, he get the ID and he create the span from request. The creation of creating span from the request is as simple as extracts the relevant bits from the HTTP header and decide if we should create a new span or we should continue, and then add the code uh, of these things. Um, also, uh, sometime uh, the frameworks take this uh, under the hood, but I will like to show you. Uh, a span denotes some amount of time, so some, um, uh, some, some work which should be finished. And it is that's why important that we should close the span, because we cannot continue to work for infinity time. So if you forget to close a span, then nothing will get record on your tracing system, and you will end up and is complaining that Zipkin is broken. But Zipkin is not broken, you have to take care. If you start a span, you have to close a span. Why I was not doing it on Spring Cloud? Because Spring Cloud uh, take care of starting a span and closing a span. Um, and now I would like to show an, you. So uh, the, the next question comes in the mind is who uses tracing, whether it is some abstract concept or someone uses it. Well, here is a list uh, of the companies which use the tracing. Some of them use the Zipkin, some of them have their own solution uh, for, for tracing. Uh, Zipkin also can be uh, plays quite nice with Prometheus. So if you are, uh, if I don't know how many of you are uh, aware of Prometheus, but it has support. It exports the matrices which Prometheus can consume. And does Zipkin only works for Java uh, or uh, for Scala? No, there are a bunch of uh, services which are supported by uh, Zipkin, more than what AWS X-Ray support. Uh, and not only this, but if you are doing some, uh, let's say, big data processing, also there are some distribution which use uh, HTrace, for example, where you can trace even the same, you can apply the same concept and trace the request across various cluster of your machines uh, which are taking part in uh, processing your big data job. Uh, so the summary of, uh, the, the moral of the story is that latency is never zero, and we should embrace it rather than try to neglect it. Um, and distributed systems are hard to reason about because the call graph is really complex. Uh, to analyze end-to-end -end latency, distributed tracing comes in handy, and it also uh, tells us something about uh, uh, call graphs, how our call graph looks like. Instrumentation is really, really tricky. So if you are writing all this code by your own hand rather than using Spring Cloud Sleuth or, uh, or Zipkin, you have to take care of propagating the IDs across uh, various thread pool, callbacks, async. So in order to make the life easier, Open Zipkin provides open source tracing system and it visualizes the request flow. Uh, Spring Cloud Sleuth brings tracing to Spring World, and open, uh, open tracing try to uh, aim for standardizing the tracing. Here are the slides, you can find it on slides here, uh, and uh, thanks all of you for your attention, and I really appreciate that you came here. So if you have any questions, I'm available after the talk, and I can uh, give you answers. <laughs>